Good to have you back here on The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Our next conversation uh, is on, uh, well, a follow-up on the conversation concerning Inyobongu Moren, the late Inyobongu Moren, who was murdered after going uh, to a, well, going job searching. Uh, there, of course, has been further digging into that uh, case by David Hundane and others. And, of course, uh, a lot of other revelations have uh, emerged. Uh, mostly about the connection between uh, some persons in Akwaibom State and even higher up in, um, in uh, the police command. It's 13 days since the disappearance and subsequent death of Inyobongu Moran. And what we know is that the police have a suspect in custody. What we do not know is how far the investigation into her death has gone. Now, uh, independent journalist has published what can be best described as a plan to skew the details of Moran's killing in Uyo Akwaibom State. The journalist, David Houdain, is joining us on The Breakfast this morning. Good morning, and thanks for joining us, David. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Thanks right. for being here. All right. Let, let's start with um, um, the, the findings. Uh, a lot of people struggled with reading through the article yesterday until it eventually... Uh, was open for you know people to uh, go through it. So share with us, you know, the most uh, shocking details from your investigation. Right. So um, I think it's it's good uh, for the purpose of this conversation. It's good to start from the end, sort of the article. So um, if you remember, on May two, there was a press release from the Five Bomb State Command saying that uh, an arrest has been made. The suspect, uh, Uduak Frank Ezekiel Akbar, has been taken into custody, and that there was a team of police officers that took him into custody. One of those police officers was named as uh, Superintendent uh, Samuel Ezeugu. Now, starting from the end, as I said, if you've read the article, you'd realize that this guy, the Samuel Ezeugu, the police superintendent, has been in contact with the suspect, Frank Akbar, before the arrest. And in fact, it was the suspect who initiated conversation with this guy. And how, how I was able to establish this was that uh, I had an insider from telecoms company who actually sort of leaked uh, cold data to me. Technically, I'm not supposed to have access to that data. So when I was doing the article, I had to be very careful. I, I couldn't just publish the screenshots as they were. I had to uh, reproduce the data to try and protect uh, my sources' uh, privacy. And what those call records show, without a shadow of a doubt, is that Frank Akwan, the suspect, the 20-year-old suspect, was not working alone. And that the Akwaibom State Command is intentionally trying to present the case in a way that, su that suggests that it is a standalone offense and he's a standalone offender, so as not to potentially uh, bring in bigger people who will be potentially implicated by this case. Um, one of the most obvious ways that you, that you can figure this out is by looking at the crime scene. Now, not, nobody here is the professional crime scene investigator. Nobody here is a detective. But we know, as a matter of something that is obvious, that when there's this sort of crime, the crime scene is supposed to be cordoned off from the public. The police are supposed to have exclusive access to the crime scene. No one else except no one except law enforcement is supposed to be allowed into the crime scene. And yet, what we have seen over the past week or so is that the location where this murder took place has become something of a pilgrimage site for the public in Akaiwa. People have been walking up and down, taking videos for social media. Different pictures and videos have been popping up showing boots from youth corpus, showing books, showing uniforms, discarded clothing from previous victims, bones, that sort of thing, shallow graves. And what this does is that you are, the evidence which can be used to build a case for something much bigger than just the murder of, uh, of uh, Amy Umare, something, the, the evidence which would suggest that there is something much bigger going on, there is potentially a, uh, a human trafficking or uh, human organ trafficking ring going on. That evidence is intentionally being destroyed or compromised in such a way as to make it in, uh, uh, inadmissible in court. That's what the Akwaibom Police Command is doing. Now, I was on a TV show last night with the Akwaibom State uh, Police Commissioner, and this man spent 15 minutes just dissembling, right? Because I put these questions to him that, first of all, 
uh, your your police uh, commission, your police department is intentionally sabotaging in this case, that there's obviously something bigger going on than just a single 20-year-old suspect, and that you are intentionally bungling this case to try and make to try and make this guy, set this guy up to take the fall for everything. Obviously, this guy is a murderer. Obviously, this guy killed Inu Mora. That's not a doubt. But the point is that there's something much bigger going on. And potentially, you could be talking about something which would explain several unexplained disappearances and deaths going back a period of years. Yeah. And instead, the Akwaibo Police Command is just trying to like present it as a standalone rape and murder case against this 20-year-old guy, and that there's nothing else going on here. The case is solved. Everybody, please go home. And then they have offered no explanation as to how come this guy has been in contact with uh, at least one police officer from the Akwaibo State Command before even there was any uh, talk about arresting him or anything. And he was the one who initiated the contact. And by the way, I'm just going to quickly mention this. There's no data that I have access to that the police did not have even before I did, right? The only reason that I had access to that data is because an insider leaked it to me. The police don't need an insider. The police have access to this data at will. They are the law enforcement. They have all, all of this data. So there's nothing I'm saying which is news to them. Because they knew all of this even before I did. Right, so, David, so then you'd have to ask. Sorry, so go ahead. Really, David, I, I was actually going to ask you because going through that article you wrote, I saw how you basically gleaned information just by using tech. Tools that people will see as simple, like True Caller, you were able to use those sources to trace the phone records and history of the prime suspect in this case. So then, if you say that the issue is not that the police does not have access to tech and data, what really is the problem here? Also, you had this gut feeling that uh, you know the prime suspect Udrak was not acting alone. Why did why did you have that feeling? Well, first of all. Um let me start with your second question as to why it, I think it's obvious that he wasn't acting alone. Um, if you the um, videos and texts and pictures that have been showing up on social media over the past few days, showing the site of the crime, we've been seeing materials there, some with dates on them like books and stuff, going back as far back as 2013, right? And the suspect is 20 years old. 2013 is about eight years ago. So except for saying that he started doing these things on his own at 12 years of age, and since he was 12, he has been unilaterally going around kidnapping, raping, and murdering women, and somehow was able to handle this on his own as a preteen, it's obvious he has been working with people. And then the phone records, which I also published in, in the article, clearly suggest that there is at least one person whom we don't know of because this person's number wasn't registered on on true color, you weren't able to, to bring up this person's identity, this, this unknown person, is in constant contact with this Uduak Frank Akpan fellow. So who is this person we don't know? I, I, I tried all the tricks in the book, and it, we don't know. Like, so after the article got published yesterday, then several people got in contact to tell me that they went to, to check that number, and that magically that number started showing up on true color and on similar applications as Frank Akpan. So was Frank, was Frank Akpan talking to Frank Akpan on the phone? Hmm. That doesn't make any sense. So who is this person? We don't know. That needs to be established. And then the, sorry, just uh, refresh my mind about what the first question was. Here. I, the first question I was asking you was talking about, you know, police data, really. Right, 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 right. So um, as I mentioned, there's no data I have that the police don't have in multiples. They know much more about this case than I do. So then, you that, when you now ask yourself, why are they in intent on presenting this case in a way that clearly makes no sense, in a way that clearly suggests that this individual person is being set up to take the fall for a bigger case? Well, the only, the only conclusion you can reach is that the police themselves are in on this thing. And bear in mind that the police put out a press statement stating that this fellow has been arrested, and that this group of officers, including SP uh, Samuel Ezeogo, uh, heroically apprehended the suspect and blah, blah, blah. And then the phone records show that, first of all, this murder was committed on the 29th of April. On the 30th of April, shortly after meeting this uh, mystery Kufri F. Young person at uh, the high end hotel in Uyo, owned by Godfrey Lapadio, then the suspect then calls a police officer, this police officer, on the phone. And they have a conversation for 90 seconds, 93 seconds. 
So what were they talking about? Why is the suspect initiating contact with the police officer? How did he get the police officer's number? What were they talking about? Only two of them and the phone network can give us that information. I didn't have access to the actual uh, voice notes, the actual call data. So I don't know what was said. All I had access to was, was the, 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 the call record. So it's only those two people who can tell us what they're talking about and how it is that somebody who will later be arrested by this police superintendent, Samuel Ezeogo, called him a couple of days before I had a conversation with him for 90 seconds. And when I put this question to the police commissioner yesterday, police, com uh, police commissioner gave an absurd reply. I, like, I don't think he thought it through. He said, he said uh, the police were trying to lure out the suspect. Well, it's the suspect that initiated the contact with this police officer. So how on earth did the suspect get this police officer's number? And what were they talking about? So before you start talking about whether the police is trying to lure him out, so clearly that's a lie. So what is going on here? And why is that quite bomb state police command being less than truthful with us? These are the questions that need to be asked. So, so it, it, should it be, or would you expect that it would be normal um, investigation procedure that the police should have, even before you did, should have gone through his phone records, should have seen that he spoke with these persons, should have maybe also been questioning these other persons that I, you know, in his phone records. Um, should that, you know, is that expected to be normal procedure? And why do you think that's not happening? I mean, I think that's obvious. I think uh, even, even before making any kind of public statement, this thing should have been done. And as I've said twice now, all of this information is freely available to the police. It's very easily available. All it takes is one phone call. If the police wants to requisition information from, from the telecoms company, it's not a difficult thing for them to do. They don't need to go to court and get an order or something. They are the police. They have their ways and means of doing these things. Right? Ordinary citizens like us can't do it. In fact, technically, the fact that I had access to these things, technically is against the law. Technically, it's against the NCC code. Technically, I'm not supposed to have access to these things. The only reason I did is because an insider risked their job to give me access to these things. Right? And take, I mean, they were to be found, found out they'd be in very serious trouble. So the police has this information ahead of everybody else. So even, like, why have they been so invested in pretending as if they don't know anything, and that the entire case begins and ends with this 20-year-old fellow called uh, uh, Frank Akpa. And there's, you know, everybody please go home. This guy is a serial rapist. That's all there is to it. We've arrested him. Uh, hopefully, uh, we haven't even released a mock shot to show that we've arrested him, but just take our word for it that we've arrested him, and everything is fine. Nothing to see here. Go home. It's the end. So I'm sorry, that's not good enough. So, so does right? this we need answers? Does this does this also? If the, if the, sorry, sorry. Yeah, and I Go just ahead. was going to ask you know if this also um, you know should point uh, Nigerians and you know to start to think of other cases that have been you know like this and the fact that there was no further investigation into many other cases. It ended with one person being a prime Absolutely. suspect, and that's it. Absolutely. The the idea that. Uh, by sort of like this bungled five minute investigation, we can get a full picture of what has happened and that nobody is allowed to question uh, what the outcome of the case was. It's absurd, right? I don't think it's a controversial comment to say that there is a lot of corruption in the Nigeria police force, right? That's not a controversial comment to me. I have family members in the Nigeria police force, so it's not as if I have something personal against Nigerian policemen or something. But it's just the reality. We know what it is. Like, none of this is a secret. So if the point is now being raised that, look, there's something very fishy about the way this case and other cases like this have been handled, and that the way sort of like the police goes out of its way to avoid doing actual investigative work, which, by the way, they are very well qualified and very well equipped to do, and instead they find ways to avoid doing their job and to sort of like just tie everything under a pretty bow and you know everybody go home that's the end and call that justice i don't think it's it's a, it's a controversial uh, opinion to hold that this is not good enough it's simply not good enough it simply won't do especially in a case like this where i i think uh, especially in the younger demographic of nigerians that you know a lot of us identify with we can all see a bit of ourselves in in Umare, right this person was just going to look for a job that's all. She didn't commit any crime. She wasn't hurting anyone. She just wanted a job. 
and she went looking for a job. She went looking for a job interview, and then she got horrendously, you know, raped and murdered. So then, like, it, it, it then feels as if so. If at that level you can't do anything in Nigeria without, you know, being liable to suffer such things, and then the police afterward is going to come out and start acting as if they are a PR practitioner working on behalf of the criminals, and are instead trying to shield people from justice and are trying to obstruct any possibility of an actual investigation taking place. Well, then, clearly we have a problem. So, David, I personally have a problem. David, the then, um, we, we understand how bad it is or how bad it seems to be here in the country. Your article implicates two key people. You implicated, uh, apart from Uduak, you know, who you're now saying, you know, is touted to be the lone suspect. You implicated SP Sam Izugu, as well as a staff of the Federal Ministry of Niger Delta, that's Kufri F. Young. In more saner climes, what would be the fate of these people and what would the police be doing rather than come on national TV and actually defend them? In saner climes, even before I did an investigative you know, article or anything, these two people would have already been in custody because, as I said, the police have access to all, all of this phone data, all of these phone records. So to, uh, specifically with, with regard to the Kufri F. Young fellow, who I think is probably the key to the entire story based on the type, the length of interaction and the time of the interaction that he had it with, and the sheer divergence between the kind of circles he moves in and the kind of circles that the suspect moves in. So if I were the police, it would be very obvious that this is a person of interest here. How is it that this high-ranking civil servant who stays in sort of like the Koyi of Uyo, the, you know, the up the up market part of town. This person on paper has nothing in common with someone like Frank Akpan. So how is it that Frank Akpan is coming to visit this guy at this address in Ewet Housing Estate? They are, they are spending four, five, six minutes on the phone. They're exchanging text messages. What are they talking about? What is the nature of the interaction with, between them? What is the relationship? I cannot believe that you then say that you have taken in the suspect Frank Akpan and that the person the suspect has been communicating with repeatedly, and then the, person, the police officer that, that this suspect started communicating with shortly after he, he, he finished communicating with the Kufri F. Young fellow, which would, in, uh, which would indicate that this Kufri F. Young fellow has probably given him this police officer's contact details. And then you say, no, there's, 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 there's nothing to see there. It's fine. It's just a sole uh, suspect. And if I hadn't had access to this data, if someone hadn't actually leaked it to me, we simply wouldn't know. And we would just think, you know, it's, well, maybe the police are, are, are telling the truth. Maybe it's just one person. Maybe he wasn't working alone. Yeah, and maybe he was actually working alone. And that's it. You know, why on earth are the police so invested in hiding from facts which are now in the public domain? Except they want to argue that the data that I presented is not true, in which case I can present the data in full, you know, and then we can compare it with the data that they have. Because by law, the, tele the telecoms company isn't allowed to tamper with such data. So it's always going to be the same data. Mm. The one I have and the one they will show. All right. Same so, data. so David, what is going on? That's well, the question. David, so basically you're saying we, we can trust the police to carry out a thorough investigation into this murder of the young girl who will now be buried on Friday, May 14th. Certainly not the Akwai Bomb State Police Command as it, as it currently exists, not uh, led by a police commissioner who came on TV yesterday and lied to the entire country that the reason that the suspect was having contact with one of his men was because the police was trying to lure him out. Meanwhile, it was the suspect that initiated contact with his man, with somebody working under him, a superintendent of police, a senior police officer. So how can you expect justice from, from such a setup? Clearly, the Akwai Bomb State Police Command, for whatever reason, has taken a side here, and it's not on the side of justice, right? I'm not going to uh, make, you know, an, a frontal accusation on TV, you know, because I'm not trying to get you guys, you know, fined five million naira by Lai Mohammed. But the, fa the fact is that the Quai Bomb State Police Command has taken a side, and it's clear that if they are left to their own devices, there is going to be no actual investigation, and there's going to be no actual closure. They're just going to find a way to tie a neat bow and everything and tell everybody to go home and wait until this blows over and the public loses interest, as always happens in Nigeria. That's what they're banking on, that eventually people will get tired of people will move on and right. then we'll rest.
David Hundain, thank you so much for your work and for the article, and we hope that um, it starts um, a process where more and more lives will be saved uh, from um, uh, situations like this. We'd we'll love to speak with you again. Indeed, David, thank you very Thanks much. Absolutely. So we'll take a break here and return to discuss uh, the national issue of security. Do stay with us.